it all in his hand. I heard the songwriter say, we put it all in his hand. Best hands we can be in. Let somebody say praise the Lord. We honor the Lord on this, the Lord's day. We thank him for his goodness, for his mercy, for his everlasting hand of love on us. Not that we have deserved it, but because he loves us so much. Thank God for you that are here. Amen. Thank God for First Lady being here. My heart and part of my soul. I just want her to know today how honored I am that the Lord chose her for me. And she has certainly been a jewel and a stabilizer. Thank God for her. Thank God for our viewing audience on YouTube and Facebook. We worked out some of the kinks. And I feel forgiveness for on Sunday, the new equipment is always a challenge, and no matter how much you rehearse, you don't know how it's going to work until it comes time for it to work. But God has favored us to always get his word out, and so we sometimes you have to adapt and adjust. And God equips us to do that very thing to adjust and to adapt to get things done, not compromise. I did not say compromise. I did not say cheat. Uh, as we honor the Lord with the service of our lives, it is never the goal to win at any cost. For the Bible says we ought to present ourselves righteous and holy and to follow peace with all men uh, as much as we can in holiness. And he said, without such, no one shall see the Lord. So to win at any cost and then miss seeing God defeats the purpose. I'd rather lose the battle and win the war of seeing Jesus. And that's what we do. And we certainly are praying our hearts go out at the loss of our dear, 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 dear friend here in the community, Miss Celia Whitehead. She has been a pillar of godliness, always living a life that honors God, always looking beyond the natural eye and seeing in the spiritual. No matter what she was confronted with, she maintained the faith. No matter what was going on, she stood steadfast in Jesus. And so the Lord took her on today. And death as we depart this world, not only is is death of the believer a blessing. And it's and what I'm going to say, let me qualify it by saying it does not mean you are any less holy or any less saved. There's no such thing as less saved. Less saved. You're either saved or you're not. How you embrace your faith and and how you exemplify holiness. Now there is a difference. You, I do believe that there are some believers that are more committed and steadfast than others. I believe that. And I, I, I say this, that's why I say this cautiously and not in the finest or not in the basis of definition, but sort of, sort of an adjective or an illustration, if you will. I believe some people are more holy than others. If you can receive that scripturally, biblically. Um, I believe that some, both, some people live a more exemplified example of holiness than others. 
The Bible talks expressly about that. But I don't believe you can be more saved because we are saved by grace. The grace of God through faith and it's not of works. But it's a gift of God lest any man should boast. But I do believe that you can live, some people can live a more committed, holier life than others. And that describes Celia Whitehead. No matter what the issues were in the community, and especially as it involved race relations, no matter how crucial or even ugly it may get or it may have gotten. Celia always stood on the side of God's righteousness and what the Lord says. And uh, she was a jewel and a blessing. I'm gonna miss her. You know, she was my friend. Every week she would send me a, a, a YouTube clip well, she would send me, you know, a Bible verse and encouragement for the week. She would share things that she would be reading. And she had age on her. So a lot of people at, at her age, they tend not to read as much because they figure they know all that they are going to know in life. But she was always looking for a better way, a more effective way of loving people through the eyes of God. And she would send those little encouragements to me. And uh, most of the time, nine out of 10 times, I would just send her back a thank you. There was one or two times, depending on what I was doing in the moment, that I may not have responded, but it was only once or twice. But whenever she would send them to me, I would thank her because she would remind me through that act, that no matter how much, how it looks in the natural, we are the servants and the example of the living God. And her life was that you should exemplify that no matter what. And we are certainly going to miss her. And uh, one thing about it, she adds to the, to the statement that we often say in the church. She has gone from labor to reward. She won't get old anymore. She won't hurt anymore. Those that love the Lord that she knew in her life, she will see them right after she sees Jesus. It's worth living for. And God gives us two opportunities or two platforms. There are two platforms that God gives us in the Bible. There were those that lived as John the Baptist lived. God separated John the Baptist from, from uh, the population. John the Baptist lived most of his life as a hermit. Because God had to deal with him. On a daily, probably hour by hour basis, like Moses, because there were things that God had appointed John to do that was not written in the book. John's mission was prophesied long before John came. The prophet Isaiah said there would be a front runner that would come to introduce the Savior, the Messiah, and that person was John. So God isolated John most of his life so that God could have his attention. Then the other platform is when God puts us in the midst of the population. God puts us in the midst of the culture. It's a, it's a calling they're both callings. One tends to be more challenging than the other. Because I know people who are quite content 
with living off into the wilderness all by themselves. They do it all the time because they don't desire to be around people that they have to uh, 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 try and cultivate or influence how they behave. If you're living by yourself, you got nobody to be concerned about but yourself. And some people, you have tribes like that. You have cultures like that. They live off in the wilderness or in the jungles or wherever, all by themselves. Their rules are for them. They made them, they accept them. There is no outside influence or interference. Then that's the platform that God puts us, the church, in. God chose the church to be in the culture of them that would be saved. He said to the apostles, as he spoke of a certain group of Jews and Gentiles that had not come to believe in Christ. And he said, them also I must bring. He said, they are, there are some sheep that are not of this fold. And he said, them also I must bring. And there shall be one shepherd, one sheep, and one shepherd. And God has called the church in this day to be that called out, the ecclesia, the called out. That is the biblical definition of the church, the ecclesia, the called out. God called the church out to go and win those sheep. But in order to do that, we have to be just as focused on God in the culture as John the Baptist was in the wilderness. God calls even those groups and cultures that are in the wilderness. They still have to interact. But God has, but, but it's, it, it, even in, in, in isolated cultures, you're still going to have people that won't, that don't want to align themselves with the rules. But it's a lot easier to deal with them in an isolated culture because the rules are very simple. You either follow the rules or you're out. And based on where they were, it was very difficult for them to live isolated and by themselves in certain environments. But in the environment that we are in today, God has called us into a, in a culture and an environment, and then he has given each and every one of us the, uh, the ability and the option of rejecting Jesus Christ. So God has said, I want you to be as meek as lambs, but as shrewd as a servant. He says, I'm going to send you in the midst of the wolves. Why? Because there are other sheep that are not of this fold. Them too I must bring. And we don't win them by capitulating and surrendering to the culture. If that were the case, God would have no need for witnesses or messengers. There would have been no need for Jesus to come. There would be no, there would have been no need for Jesus to, to leave his throne in heaven as that of being God. A member of the Godhead. He left his place in glory. He was incarnate in Mary. And he was delivered by the Holy Spirit into the very culture that he created. And he did that for the sole purpose of redeeming mankind back into himself. We can never know the true heart and love that exuberates from God. And people have misinterpreted 
and abused God's definition of love. When people say that God loves everybody, yes, he does. He loves us so much that he himself exposed himself to his own wicked creation, a fallen people, a fallen mankind that he knew would reject him, that he knew would abuse him. But he wanted us to have every opportunity as he sent us from eternity or from nothing, God called us into being and delivered us into this world. Don't you know it's a privilege that God has given the human being to walk the earth because he didn't have to. He could have created you a rock or a bird or a chair, but he gave you the most privileged existence of all. He says, I am going to create you in my image after my likeness. I'm going to put you on the earth for to be what? For what purpose? To be the shining of my glory and to honor me. Every, all of God's creation honors God, but the highest creation that he created, which is man. All of nature honors God without fail. We think about weather. When the snow falls and it's so deep that people are shut up in their homes and they're saying, man, we got to, you know, we can't survive with all of this snow. We got to do something. Don't you know the snow itself is glorifying God? When the tornado comes, when the earth quakes, when the tsunami rears its head, that is nature responding to the glory of God. Oh, what a wonderful thing. When the sun rises in this morning in the east and sets in the west, when the equator rotates and shifts, they talk about global warming. All of the movement of the earth, all of the global changing since the world was created is all the orchestrated work of God. And they honor God without fail. Somebody can't receive this, but in the ecological system of things, when the big fish eat the small fish, the small fish are honored because they were created to eat what they eat and to be eaten by them that eat them. Rarely, I, I, I look at sheep and cattle and pigs. Sometimes I, I've been to slaughterhouses and watched them as they as they get ready to die, they don't put up a fight. And a lot of times they know they're being, getting ready to be slaughtered. But you know what? They give their life and they honor the divine will of God. Everybody does that but man. But God said, I've given you a special ability that I didn't give them. I've given you my glory, and I've given you the freedom of choice. See, the Lord knew from Adam and Eve, some of us would fall by the wayside, all of us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory. But God says, I sent you a savior, Jesus Christ. And things are bad in the earth. We're looking at some tough times now. But not anything that is any different from other periods in history uh, when you compare it to the time in history that it was. There were some amazing things going on long before we came along. And we know this 
when we consider the seven wonders of the world. When we consider things that are on the earth, that man can't figure out how they were created. There are civilizations that we applaud and that archaeologists and scientists, they are researching even to this day. And it's amazing to them in 2024 when these civilizations existed thousands of years ago in that same token. And at some point, they were no more. The culture, the people were wiped from the face of the earth. Only the remnant of what they had in their midst. So that tells me all through history, there was a dynamic time of progression and, and, and ingenuity and intelligence. It came and it went. Yes. And in every period of history since Adam, God has had a remnant in the midst to warn the people and to tell the people, to tell the people and to warn the people that your soul is a very precious and eternal thing that you must preserve. And in addition to the book, God is saying, I'm going to send you messengers yes, yes, to remind you that there is a God above all gods. His name is Jehovah. Yes. Yahweh. Elohim. Adonai. Yes. And God is saying, I'm calling the last day's church to remind them. So God has called the Ecclesia for such a time as this. And we need to be strong. We're all leaving here one day. Yes, yes. If I got to go, let me go a mortar for the Lord. Let me go down no matter how I go, but in a way that God is pleased. Nobody may ever know my name, but my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm somebody. If your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are somebody. Will the church shine in darkness in the last days? Will we stand up? We see a lot of people today that will not. We're watching churches. We're watching church folks every day capitulating. Surrendering to the will of man for whatever reason, but the end was foretold. The Lord is speaking to us, the last day's church, and he is reminding us that the pure in heart shall see God. Yes, yes. The pure in heart, y'all, shall see God. And not drink, do not drink the Kool-Aid of this demonic anti-God world system. It's designed to take you away. The true test of being Holy Ghost filled is that you live a life 24-7 that is pleasing to God. Yes, we're going to miss the mark. Yes, we're not always going to get it right. But the point is, every minute of every day, you're saying to yourself, subconsciously, am I pleasing God? Is this pleasing God? If we're pleasing God, we're doing what's required in the natural. But what we're doing today is my opinion that we are doing things that are pleasing the flesh and the world at the expense of pleasing God, and then we're telling ourselves that we are, or we're telling ourselves, I don't have a choice. But I want you to know today, go to your book of, go to your Bible, to the book of Ephesians. I want you to know today that God already knew Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Is anybody listening to me today? Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. 
What did Paul say to the Ephesians? It's no new doctrine. God is saying the, the things you're going to deal with, the, they've all happened before. He said there's no new thing that just happened to you. Uh, the preacher, Solomon, said there is nothing new under the sun. Everything is, that is has been. But in the Ephesians chapter 4 at, at, at chapter 4 at verse 14, we, at verse 16, we find Ephesians 12. Excuse me, y'all. Ephesians chapter number 12. No, 4. Ephesians 4 and 12. What does Paul say in Ephesians 4 and 12? He said, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then Paul reminds us early on in that chapter, he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6 and 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So Paul is telling us this is a phenomenon that is not new. It's a phenomenon that we will confront in life. It is part of an existence that we only realize when we are connected to God. What is that? There is a spiritual realm that we cannot see unless God allows us to see it. Even when demonic forces are involved, oftentimes it's a trick of the mind because in the supernatural realm, angels have the ability to mess with your mind. They have the ability to impact what you see and what you feel, what you think. Why? Because the devil attacks your mind. Fear changes how you think. Intimidation changes how you think. This is why we have to make it our business to be focused on God in everything that we do. It does not matter what your vocation is. You're the president. You work for the sanitation department. You dig ditches. You're a college professor. You're standing on the corner begging. You're a Wall Street broker. It is all, no matter what your vocation is, our life, our mindset ought to be, okay, Lord, what is it that I should be saying and doing? And if you're not connected to God, Paul is saying the forces of darkness can, will overtake you and if you're not connected to God and fully committed, fear and intimidation will cause you to walk away and not support the work of the ministry and not believe God. We lend our spirit to all kind of demonic oppression, lust, anger, hate, fear, intimidation. All of these things. And if we are not careful, our minds can be corrupted to the point that we lose it. We call it mental illness. There is demonic oppression of the mind. Then there is mental illness. And Paul says all of it to some degree 
is the war that is perpetrated on the human being for what? One purpose, to keep you from the eternal God of heaven so that when you leave here and we see and hear the testimonies and the YouTube videos and the movies all the time, when you die, you're going to see the light or you're going to see the darkness. God already said it. There's only two places for you to go. And when we think about how brief life is, I think about young people. I'm thinking about young people. And they see life as being infinite. Then they realize one day they're cut short. As we get older, no matter how old we are, I was with a dear lady on yesterday, 87 years old. Now to the average person, she's like, I've been here a long time. But you know what? The older you get in the human world, the more you realize how small a time you've been here when it comes down to eternity. People have a problem dealing with eternity because the human mind has been relegated to God's design to measure existence, which is what? Time. God placed time in creation so that we could measure yes. days, months, and seasons. But when you die, one thing the Bible declares, and a lot of witnesses, they say when they were and when they were taken for these spiritual supernatural episodes, escapades. Or, or occurrences they always said time stopped because what they thought was a long time when the Lord sent them back into their bodies they realized it was only a matter of minutes or hours or days but when they got over to the other side the one thing they all realized a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So when you spend eternity in hell it is not going to be measured in time. It's going to be measured in torment. And that's all you will know. I think they will be given an opportunity to see people who've been brought into that supernatural realm for whatever reason God chooses to do it and they see those souls come for a temporary stay I'm talking about people who have talked about out of body experiences and yeah. have gone places I don't know this to be documented but based upon so many testimonies I have heard that the spirits the souls that were in captivity a lot of them saw these people's occurrence, what God was showing them, and how they were allowed to leave. And almost all of them said they heard the torment yes. of the lost. And I think only thing they get to see as it relates to time, those condemned souls, they get to see those that are coming briefly they have not been condemned and they see them go away and they're calling out and they're begging to be released but as, as it relates to days, hours, and months you're in a realm you don't know anything about this is why God says trust not in thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him I don't care what people tell you they have no idea what happens. The Bible tells us what happens. And then the Bible gives us examples through people that pretty much verify what the Bible has said. 
And almost all of those experiences entail seeing a, 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 an episode or an occurrence in the light and what was happening in the darkness. So Esther said this, Esther 4 and 14, you don't have to go there. Um, For if thou altogether holdest thou peace at this time, this is Mordecai talking to his niece, Esther. And she's trying to decide if she's going to go and be courageous for the Lord. Are you going to be courageous? Everybody going to be courageous for the Lord? Man, are you, are you so grateful to God for what he's done in your life? Things that could have went bad. God allowed you to make it through. Okay, you don't have Donald Trump money. But you got peace. Ha! Peace like a river. Yes, yes. Everything doesn't always go your way. That's why I wake up every day and say, Lord, I thank you for all that you've done. Yes. Because you didn't have to do it. Yes, yes. But you did. Yes, Jesus. So, Israel is having an issue because of the Persians are being induced by Haman to destroy them to the point where Haman causes the Persian king to, to, to sign a decree. He's trying to set the Jews up. And so he goes and he gets the, a, he gets the king of Persia to declare a decree that if anybody is serving the God Jehovah and not bowing down to the Persian king, they would be put to death. And the king signs this decree, this decree, and makes it, he's getting ready to send out a decree that since the Jews won't serve him, they are captive in that kingdom, he's going to sign a decree, a decree that says if you find the Jew, if you find one of those circumcised believers of Jehovah, you have the king's authority to kill him. And Hyman's thing is he wants to destroy them all because of his own insecurity. And so the decree has been signed. Somebody, anybody know a decree being signed in this day that looks like it's going to be bad for the country? Anybody know of anything that's happening where it looks like from the rich and powerful, from where government sits, where government sits, things are going to be bad for us. But you just got to keep trusting and praying and believing yes. in the God of the Bible. Yes, yes, Lord. And while the decree is signed, yes. Mordecai goes to Esther, who has yes. favor with the king, yes, Lord. and say, you know, yes, Lord. there are some things you can do but Esther reminds her uncle, first of all, I'm one of his wives, but they have rules up here. You can't go before the king unless you're called. Being in the king's, one of the king's wives, you can't say, I want to see the king. No, the way it worked back in them days, the king would say, I want to see you. And if you showed up in the king's court without being Invited, the penalty for that is death. Now, what Mordecai, Esther's uncle, wants Esther to do, because Esther has favor with the king, she he wants her to violate that law and go tell the king that what Mordecai, what Haman is doing, is a lie, and he's lied to. The king of Persia. Not that they're not going to serve him. But he made the king of Persia think. That there was a. Uh, uh, there was a, a coup being planned. And that the Jews would overrun his kingdom. And he needed to get rid of anybody. That didn't worship. His God. Or actually worship him. Because in those days. 
your heathen kings and your, your pharaohs, they actually believed that they were God. And so uh, uh, Esther's like, you know, I love you. I'm a, I'm a Jew. I don't think I'm greater than who I am. I'm just trying to save my own skin. Because first of all, not because I don't care, but because first of all, I don't think it's going to do any good because the man got rules and I haven't seen this guy. He's ruthless and he's not playing. For me to go in there, first of all, I won't even get to say it. What I need to say. And because he don't want to be, the king doesn't want to be seen as weak. He's not going to make exception for me because I'm only one of his wives. He had just killed the previous wife. That's how Esther got in there. He summons the previous wife. She decides, I'm going to be caring. I'm special. I'm not going to go out there and entertain his friends. And it cost her her life. So Esther gets elevated. But Esther's like, I know how this ends. But then Mordecai says to her, because he honors God. And he's made himself, he's put himself at risk. And all of Israel is at risk. God is going to protect Israel no matter what. People see what's going on in Israel today and they think that somehow Israel's defeat is going to benefit somebody else. I'm coming to tell you here, the Bible says over and over and over, Israel's demise will only be the beginning of the demise of the world. Israel will not fall before the rats. I don't care what the scientists say. I don't care what the Hamas says. I don't care what the Quran says. I don't care what the UN says. I don't care what the Bible scholars say. What the Bible says is that Israel is the key in the existence of mankind. So for anybody to wish Israel's demise or destruction and you're not saved, you're just praying and hoping to go see Satan earlier than you might have had to go. It will not end well for you. That's like burning down your house for the insurance money and, not, and, and, and forgetting that your family was inside. So Mordecai says to her, if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. God is going to, if you don't do it, God will find another way. I don't want God to work in spite of me. Now, if I fail, God is going to still be God. But if I'm looking to do the will of God, I heard the bishop, Paul Morton, say, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, he said, don't do it without me. Whatever God is doing in this season, I don't want him to do it without me. I don't want him to do it in spite of me because that means I'm going to get left out. I say to my friend that was that left him today, that was killed today. Whatever God was doing in this season, he didn't do it without her because she's with Jesus now. She paid the price that, that Jesus required, which is, Lord, I surrender. I give you my heart. And my service, the service of my life is to you. That's all God is asking for. The rest he will direct. If you keep that in mind, you won't fear death. Now, nobody has, I don't know. I don't have a death wish. But I thank God he's brought me to a place, first lady, where I don't fear death. Just be prepared. Like my pastor always taught, 
Be prepared. So if, when the Lord take you, you don't leave your family in distress. Handle your business. So when the Lord comes and gets you, people ain't not got to be sitting around worried about how they're going to bury you. Where's the deeds? Where's the bank statements? Who owns this? Who owns that? People fighting over whatever you done left behind. No, God says, get those things in order. You know, there's wealthy people. They put their death affairs in order as soon as they acquire wealth. Why? Because that's all they worry about is they know at some point I may leave here, but what I don't have to worry about is what I'm leaving behind. The Lord is saying to us, make preparation for your soul. And then handle your affairs. Yes. God came to Hezekiah and told him, get your house in order. So, Mordecai tells Esther, if you don't do it, deliverance will come from another way. He said, but thou in thy father's house shall be destroyed. Now, he, he was telling her, they may kill us that are in this place. Those people that were in that Persian country in captivity, they may kill us, but they will not destroy Israel. They might kill me. Oh, hey, he shut up. But you won't kill the New Testament church. You won't kill the power of God in this world. God will work with you or down to you. No matter how big or small you think your contribution to the world is, if I'm giving that service to God, then God is pleased. And they might take me, but they won't take the gospel. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. He has determined. He says in the book of Revelation that when the Holy Ghost comes, that Satan will turn up the heat on coming and trying to destroy your soul. <clears throat> Why? Because he knows that his time is near. Mm -hmm. He is desperate. He understands eternity. We don't. Not in this life. But when we go, when you leave this body, you want to understand a whole lot of things you didn't understand and if you leave here with your name not written in the book, if you leave here not having been surrendered to God, what the Lord is going to say, all the stuff you think you needed to know, that you didn't know, that you couldn't know, but the one thing that you did know or could have known is Jesus was your only way, the only truth, the only life, and you were told why. Because he said, I called the Ecclesia. I called the church. For such a time as the one that you're living in. The one that I'm living in. And we have a demand by God to proclaim his truth. No matter what's happening. No matter what your cousin is doing. What your grandmama is doing. What your boss is doing. What your spouse is doing. What your children are doing. Your co-workers are doing. Jesus has said, you have this word in you. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 1 that the things of God that are clearly seen, we see them and that to the degree that there is no excuse. Every human being created on the earth has enough of God's presence in them to know that there is a God. So he says, if you don't help and surrender and, and, and go stand for God and for his people, somebody else will. But your house, your uncle, the people that raised you, God preserved you. The uncle Mordecai had raised Esther when her parents died. And he said, we raised you. We prepared you. God put you in our care to preserve you to be where you are today. And if you don't do your part, 
Go up and find somebody else. But we, the people that you say you love, will be destroyed. We always in life, we oftentimes destroy the very people we love because our hearts are not in the right place. Our hearts are not pure. We've been or we've been deceived by the enemy. Somebody help me. And then Mordecai tells Esther, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? The, um, I think it was uh, Luther Bond saying, it's your time. It's our time. As Jesus was praying in the garden in John chapter 17, you need to familiarize yourself with the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane because it was a very important prayer. Jesus prayed for himself. He prayed for them in the world that would be saved. Those sheep that were not of the fold and he prayed for the church. And in John 17 and 11, he says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And Jesus was talking to the Father. He says, I'm coming to you. This is that prayer in the God of Gethsemane where they said Jesus prayed three times. Told the disciples, Y'all step back here and pray with me. And twice they fell asleep. Third time Jesus went back there and had to wake them up. He said, sleep on. It's done. What is the point? Prayer is not always easy. Sometimes you just fall right into it and it just flows like a river. Then some days you've got to struggle with it. Sometimes you can be so conflicted that that man you find yourself praying stuff is not even God's will. And you know it ain't why. Because even if we love the Lord, we can sometimes be conflicted. You find yourself involved in things with your family that you know they're wrong. But you want to support your family. And if you're not careful, we oftentimes try and make exceptions for them. We don't have a problem telling my neighbor he wrong. But then when our own do it, we have to find justification for them. Well, here's the justification. I love you. Jesus loves you. We know God can work it out. We've seen this before. But what cannot happen is for us to make you think it's okay for you to stay in this condition, this decision. We've all sinned and come short of the glory. But I don't want you to think that God will make an exception for you unless you repent. I know people now, I know a gentleman now that is harboring a national fugitive, a member of his family. And sometimes, somehow he thinks this is okay. And he's a prominent person that would probably call the law on other people. But when it comes down to his own, we try to make exception. But the Lord said that uh, I'm no longer in the world. He said, Lord, I'm coming back to you. He said, but Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one and I was talking to one of our church members on Sunday who asked the question about the Trinity and I said to them several places in the Bible God makes it clear that the triune Godhead is one God one God God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit is one God that is operating, he has three operations. Father's operation. The Word. The Word of God is God. But he has a operation. The Word of God came to be the Savior. And the Holy Spirit, 
God the Holy Spirit. Another operation. One God. Three operations. God is not a tripod type being. Maybe three separate entities. He's one God where he operates but by his own power he operates in three operations why? The Father is holy he has no communication or contact at all with sin or darkness Darkness or sin cannot stand before God. That's why he cast Lucifer and the angels out. But then, before the foundation of the world, God says, I got to have a way of delivering the human soul when I create it. And so, in a conversation with himself, he says, I'll go. And then the word, of God came forth. And the Bible said the word was made flesh and, 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 and dwelled among us. So, so God didn't create somebody else to come. What he made was a body for himself. And the Holy Spirit is always the power of the glory. So we look at our makeup, we look at God. We are tripod type beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. But here is the difference. Your makeup, Paul said, that I pray that your whole soul, your whole spirit, body, and soul be preserved, be saved. Which meant we are when we get saved, we are saved, the Bible says, instantly in the spirit. Progressively in the soul, which is our mind, our emotion, our heart, and then future in the body. So what that says, if we have to be transformed in a progressive manner, our spirit, our tripod type being does not operate as one. That's the problem. God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, they are one. They act as one. They think as one. They never oppose each other. They are not ever separate in essence. They are separate in operation just like your spirit is a separate operation. Your soul is a separate operation. Your spirit, the one God created you in, gives you animation. When God breathed the breath of life in you, you became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2. But when God breathed in you, and you became a living soul, Soul, having a mind, emotion, and will. But it was the Spirit of God that gave you animation. We learn this from the book of Ezekiel and the dry bones. God told Ezekiel to preach to the dry bones. And the dry bones, they all came back together. And the skin and the joints and all this stuff formed. But Ezekiel said they had, they was laying there dormant because they had no life. So God tells Ezekiel, preach to the four winds. The Bible says when Ezekiel preached to the four winds that the bodies stood up and became God's army. So what am I saying? When God breathed the breath of life in you, you became a separate person. You had a mind emotions and a will of your own but it is God's breath when he breathed in your nostrils that gave you the ability to get up you were clay you laid there you couldn't do anything 
until the spirit of life was breathed in you, that allowed you to get up and have animation. However, you had to have a body. So the third part of you is this shell, this human shell, where on your last day, the Bible says, at your funeral, if you have one, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. So you are a tripod type being. You are spirit, soul, and body. But because of your fallen nature, because we no longer have perfect harmony with God, your tripod type beings, your triune entities, don't work together. They oppose each other. How do you know? Your spirit of animation that gives you movement has rejected the spirit of Christ which gives you holiness. You have the life of God but you don't have the spirit of God because you don't have the Holy Spirit because you've not confessed Jesus as Savior. So you don't have a connection with God. You've got a connection with human life. God allowed that. God said, I'm going to make you a living being and I would prefer that you surrender to me because we were created for his own pleasure. But God says, I'm going to give you a soul. I'm going to give you a, a mind, emotion, and a will of your own where you can reject me if you want to. It is not desired. You cannot operate and have a peaceful life and a tranquil eternity without the spirit of God. But he still has given you the spirit of life, which is different than the spirit that the Holy Ghost comes to give the New Testament believer to empower you to serve God in such a time as this. We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones to serve God. You cannot do it unless you surrender Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. God says, I give you that. Then, let's talk about your soul, your mind, emotions, and your will. Jesus said that the Spirit is willing. He said the Spirit is always willing. But the flesh rejects. The flesh is weak. The flesh gets tired. The flesh surrenders to lust. What do you mean? You want to take a drink? Your mind, emotions, and your will don't want no drink. Your spirit don't want no drink. It's your body. Your flesh wants a drink. Your flesh wants a cigarette. Your flesh wants to have sex. Your flesh wants to be arrogant. Your flesh wants to fight. Your flesh wants to sin against God. It is a separate thing. Paul Toy to the Corinthians. I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be saved and delivered by God. Look it up. So what am I saying? You operate differently. You operate as a tripartite being. The Spirit says, follow Jesus. In your mind, your emotions, you get emotional. You prefer your loved ones over what God says. And so in your mind, he says, I think I'm not going to do that. Jesus had that same issue, but he overcame it. Why? Because as he says here in John, me and the Father, we're one. So in God, when it was time for him to get arrested and go before Pilate and be hanged, he said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass, which tells us Jesus, the man, had a will of his own that was independent of Jesus, who was God. He never stopped being God. He was fully God, but he was also fully man, and Jesus is the only one 
in creation that has ever done that. It was never, it had never happened before. It will never happen again, which is all the more reason that I'm going to trust Jesus rather than man. He said, Lord, however, not my will, your will be done. So if you have the ability that your will can oppose God's will, and you do that even once in your life, then you and the Father were not one. If your flesh, if you succumb to the flesh, and your flesh opposes the spirit of God, which is the spirit of truth, Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes to guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit can never sin. The Holy Spirit will never sin because the Spirit of God and the Word of God are one person. And God says, when you believe on me, he says, I am going to impart this power on you. He says he shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in Judea, in all Judea, and unto Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Paul said in Acts 2 and 38, he says, repent. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and ye shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift that God imparts on the church. And the Lord says, I will be with you then forever until the end of the earth. What? If you serve me and if you honor me with your life, God says, I'm going to give you power. Oh, help me. We saw an incident recently where they had a big shootout in a parking lot. Oh, all these businesses connected. All the walls and all these businesses, four or five businesses in this shopping complex. All the business walls got shot up. Except God's house that was sitting right in the middle. Now strike. The Lord says, I will be with you. And God said to me, I don't want you to overlook this as a coincidence. I don't want you to think lightly on this when you see church operations that may not be what the pastor wants them to be. God says, I want you to know you are serving a purpose. The whole place, the whole church could have gotten shot up. People could have been in the church. People could have got killed that were in the parking lot. God says, don't all underestimate my love for the church and the part that you play in it. Because God has called the Ecclesia for such a time as this. God bless you. I love you tonight. You still love me. You still love Jesus. I just want to encourage you. No matter how it looks. We got to stay with Jesus because we don't have all the answers. And one thing I said about earlier, I think I left out, is not a testament of your salvation. I was saying it at the beginning. But sometimes when God takes people like he took our dear friend, Sylvia, it was almost instant. More and more today, we're seeing the saints laying down, going to sleep, and not waking up. Having a heart attack. And you're gone. You know, having a tragedy. When you're in a, in a traumatic accident or something tragic, a lot of times, like I see people in car crashes and plane crashes, the trauma is so great that you really don't feel anything. You know, I've had people say that they, they got injured. Looking at the, listening to the testimony of a guy that 
It was in a car bombing, had his legs ripped off. And he said he didn't even know that his legs were gone until they tried to get out the car. So, however God takes us, then sometimes God leaves us to be ill and to suffer. And I believe a lot of that has to do with God because how much God knew you loved him. Your loved ones. Sometimes loved ones don't do well if death is sudden and without notice. So I, in my, in the case of my own mother, the Lord allowed my mother to suffer for over a year because He knew she wanted to ease the pain, and she wanted to wait for her son, me, to get back home before he took her and he did. Father, we thank you tonight and we bless you for the opportunity to just praise you and glorify you and bask in your goodness. You are so great and wonderful. We thank you for these that have come. We thank you for the, those that, have, that are watching and hearing you by way of our ministry media. Lord, look upon our needs today. Prepare us for what is to come. Give us courage. Oh, Lord, give us courage as only you can do. Give us that courage, God, that you gave Daniel. Right before you went into the lion's den. Give us that courage and that strength of belief and faith that you gave the, he the three Hebrew boys before they willingly walked into the fiery furnace. Lord, give us that faith and that courage that you gave John the Baptist as he willingly gave his life for the gospel. And Lord, we love you today. We're praying for the Whitehead family. We're praying for the believer on today. Pray for my good friend Susan and Madison. Oh Lord, that they might be comforted. We're praying for her healing. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. God, we're praying for Enfield on today. Lord, keep us in the center of your will. Yes. Hide us under the shadow of your almighty wing. And Lord, we love you. We praise you. God, we're praying for this nation. Yes. No matter how bleak it looks. Lord, you said you know how to reward the righteous in the midst of the wicked. Thank God you know how to reward the wicked in the midst of the righteous because you're God and we love you and we praise you and we give you the glory yes. in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. We look forward to seeing you Sunday morning for our Sunday morning service right here at City Refuge Christian Center Church of God in Christ find us on Facebook, find us on YouTube like our page, be a part of the ministry join us as often as you can but I got to tell you something we're looking forward to seeing you walk through the doors so that we can look upon you we can all be in the midst of the power of God and pray one for another God bless you